Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Deborah Linares. I serve as a health scientist and project officer in the Division of Research within the Office of Epidemiology and Research at the Maternal and Child Health Bureau, Health Resources and Services Administration. The Division of Research provides ongoing support for maternal and child health, or MCH, extramural research activities, including the Engaging Research Innovations and Challenges, or the Enrich webinar series. You are joining a community of more than 100 participants with an interest in advancing MCH research. The Enrich webinar series provides technical assistance and methodologic updates aimed at stimulating interest in applied and translational MCH research. Today's webinar is about measuring family engagement in maternal and child health research, opportunities and challenges. Before we start, I would like to briefly introduce our speakers for this afternoon, Dr. Christina Bethel and Ms. Clarissa Hoover. Dr. Christina Bethel is a professor at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and founding director of the Child and Adolescent Health Measurement Initiative. She is the principal investigator of HRSA and CHB's Maternal and Child Health Measurement Research Network. Ms. Clarissa Hoover is a project director at Family Voices and started advocating for family, excuse me, patients, families, and quality healthcare shortly after her daughter's diagnosis with cystic fibrosis in 2005. She has served as a family faculty for residents and nursing students and later joined and co-founded three advisory councils supporting family-centered care at the University of New Mexico Hospital and Health Sciences Center. And I will now turn the program over to Dr. Krina, excuse me, Christina Bethel. Good afternoon, and thank you, everyone, for participating in this webinar. I look forward to um, the next few minutes and also especially our conversation and question and answer. Uh, my job is to, in the next few minutes, um, review the state of family engagement measurement um, as assessed through our maternal and child health measurement research network activities and also summarize some of the findings and gaps and opportunities um, prior to Clarissa Hoover presenting on the exciting work that Family Voices is doing on assessing family engagement in systems. So my first slide is really just to um, give thanks and acknowledgement to HRSA and the Maternal and Child Health Bureau for their vision and leadership to develop the Maternal and Child Health Measurement Research Network that allows us to stay on top of progress in the field of measurement, such as in family engagement. And just for a little background on me, the Child and Adolescent Health Measurement Initiative was founded in 1996, prior to the time when we were had many measures at all of child and adolescent health as is presented in the national surveys led by HRSA and the Maternal and Child Health Bureau today, and certainly did not have yet measures related to family engagement or participation or even family-centered care quality measures for um, health plans and pediatric practices and similarly. So the CAMI was started trying to fill this gap, starting with identifying what are our goals for child and family health, to discern and develop actionable data, um, starting where you want to end up in terms of the use of that data, and then to use the data to inspire and inform transformational partnerships that can be data-driven and coordinated to innovate and act on um, the opportunities to improve. So that's the underlying um, goals at CAMI for the last 20 years, and our focus is on family reported and family centered data and tools. And likewise, there's a lot of literature, if you actually take the time to go through, you get quite overwhelmed quickly about, about how engagement with families at all levels is linked to positive outcomes. Synthesizing that and making sense of it is very challenging, but this diagram really just points to, all the arrows point to literature and evidence that exists on how important it is to share ownership and collaboration and how that can yield the best possible outcomes. 
Early notions of family engagement really began um, in a national way around 1999-2000 when the um, Institute of Me Medicine was envisioning a national health care quality report. And at that time, family engagement was really considered to um, operate on four domains, which would be patient-centered communication and caring, patient-centered education and teamwork, consumer empowerment in the purchasing and selection of, of health services, and patient-centered systems of care, which at that time was mostly um, assessed as whether or not um, the systems themselves were customer-oriented, consumer centered and helped manage to improve population health and not necessarily to get at what Clarissa Hoover is going to present on family engagement and decision making. Um, but that was there conceptually, although not measured. And of course, we have so much to leverage, and that's really the good news for um, Institute for Patient and Family Centered Care, the child welfare. Um, sector has been involved in de um, family engagement activities and measurement for a long time. And now we're seeing CMS, um, which oversees Medicaid in the country, a big emphasis on person and family engagement in decision making and in services. And of course, the American Academy of Pediatrics has been a long advocate of defining and advancing family engagement and family-centered care. Um, AMCHIP, which is a um, critical player in the country, is working with many Title V agencies and MCHB programs on their strategies to ensure family engagement in improving systems of care for the Title V um, national outcomes and performance measures led by HRSA and MCHB. So I'm not going to read this, but all to say there are many definitions, and the good news is, is all of them really are very inspiring and yet um, also cut across many domains. Um, here's just an illustration of, not that you're going to read this, of the literature that really goes back to at least 1989, showing the critical importance of engagement at the level of services and how that is very connected to improvements in health outcomes. So this is sort of where it began. And then measurement started to move more toward engagement at the system, at the level of programs and systems. And this is a quote from the child welfare work um, and the measures they use, which really look at engagement based on um, involvement activities. Are families involved? Are um, in care, in systems, in programs? And really are starting to move more toward measures of um, whether or not families' needs were met as a predictor of engage uh, as an outcome of engagement, which is a different way to look at it. So when you look at the ultimate kind of con conglomeration of m different models that um, define family engagement, it's definitely defined across many levels. Um, it's multidimensional, dynamic in that it's not something stable. It can become and go depending on the relationships that are in place. Um, it's relationally dependent and is the, a process that's really foundational to all positive health outcomes, which makes it difficult if we use an outcomes-based frame because almost all health, positive outcomes are requiring effective engagement of families and children. So if we go with an outcomes frame, the sky is the limit. And so how do we come up with measures that are a little closer to the bone of what we're trying to discern and pull out the role of engagement? This little pyramid here really, though, says that ultimately building trust and relationships then lead to the experience of being engaged, that can allow you to be effectively engaged as a family member, and then that ends up feeding into results. Um, you can look at steps to engagement, the things that you would do, the actual experience of engagement as um, reported by families, which may be different. You can do things, but it doesn't lead to that experience. And then ultimately to what we think are the outcomes of engagement, which include um, better systems that meet families' needs better, as well as improving family health and family well-being. So there's a big range of outcomes that we hinge on this concept of engagement. In HRSA and CHBs and, uh, and the National um, Home Visiting Program, they are defining uh, family engagement in at least one of the reports based on outcomes that are expected to result 
due to engagement. And this would include really more of a family-centered approach of saying that engagement's happening if families are enrolling in, in home visiting services who need and are eligible, whether they engage um, actively during home visits, and whether they complete the intended number of home visits across the intended length of the program. And this sort of flips it on the head of, from the other measures that are looking at whether systems are doing things to engage families to whether families are actually being engaged themselves proactively. And these are really different ways of thinking about measuring engagement and are appropriate um, depending on your purposes. So it's really important to address all the interdependent aspects of family engagement overall for the system and to improve outcomes overall. However, depending on your purpose, you'll be wanting to focus in one of these four buckets, perhaps. The first is really engagement as, we, as it manifests through communication between families and providers to build trust and to be the basis upon which we can start to improve um, health and health outcomes and quality of care. There's a substantial body of research on that. Family involvement is in, to a shared decision making and plans of care is another layer in and of itself. So if families are engaged, that doesn't mean that they're necessarily involved in um, as, they, as, as much as they might like to be in really defining the plan of care for their child and family over time. And this is an area that's just now evolving more and more to define. We have models for shared care planning and decision making, but we haven't necessarily gone the distance. The next would be active collaboration with organizations and systems for results. And this is what Krista Hoover is going to be focusing more on, is how do we assess this very, very critical aspect of engagement. And finally is measuring whether families are engaged in the way that home visiting um, program was defining it to actually um, engage in services that can help improve the health and well-being of their family and child. Um, we have uh, taken it upon ourselves um, to look at measures that are being used across 11 different MCH programs, including Title V, as well as, of course, Medicaid and CHIP and Child Welfare and, help, um, and in a variety of other programs. You can find out more by going to our website. And we've categorized these generally across about 800, over 1,000 measures now across access to and quality of health care services, health and related services services, health status, well-being, and health conditions across the life course, and social determinants of health. There are measures related to family engagement in each of these areas. For family engagement in, um, as it relates to access to and quality of health services, which is a little bit more along the lines of the home visiting concept of measuring engagement in that report that I showed you, is well, well visit utilization, for example. Um, CAP surveys are available, of course, and measure family-centered care, and that's more getting at the experience of having been engaged and transition to adult, uh, adult health care. Um, this is also a Title V national performance measure. It has many elements of engagement of youth with special health care needs in particular and could be considered a, an engagement measure um, depending on the lens that you look through, similar to the other measures that are on this list. Um, big gaps that might be considered in this area could be, um, again, getting at how we can engage families in organizing systems to improve access and quality of services to engage families in goal setting and shared plans of care, to build trust and relationships, and whether that's happening as the foundation upon which so many positive outcomes are linked to. But this is a, um, in some ways, ineffable uh, concept to measure, but is getting less so, less, less so. Other potential outcomes of family engagement that fall into this area could be reductions in emergency use care, um, being healthy and ready to learn um, in ways that are emerging from HRSA and MCHB to be measured, um, having healthy family routines and habits, for example, which are also measured in the NSCH um, in many ways, and family resilience. This is just data I'm not going to go over, but it's mostly to say we've had data on some of these measures since 2001. I'm just profiling data here from 2001 to 1112 
um, because we're starting with a new baseline on the National Survey of Children's Health for 2016, so I didn't want to go further. Looking, you're not meant to really read all this. If you download the slides, you might be able to, but how well the, the family-centered care items look over across time. And they really don't, haven't really changed a lot um, in terms of doctors listening, um, providing information families need, and always feeling like a partner. And even though these look relatively high, they're actually quite low for many of the most vulnerable groups that we want to focus on, especially children with special health care needs, youth and adolescents, and when families do not have English as their primary language. Other aspects of engagement assessed in the National Survey of Children's Health that is from the 2016 and 2017 combined data that was recently released look at shared decision making. And when we can um, compare this across children with special health care needs and by household income, there is some variation. But overall, we're seeing similarities suggesting that family engagement needs to be measured and improved at a population basis. This is the data um, from the in a newer 2016 and 2017 NSCH for transition to adulthood, and uh, which includes engagement items. And as you can see, there is a long, long way to go in improving this particular measure. Another aspect of the MR MCH MRN compendium, and then I will be wrapping up, are health status um, and well-being measures that look at families participation in health behaviors that are associated with the well-being of their children. And this is, again, a different way of looking at engagement. But there's quite a few items here related from everything to sunscreen use, to house, household smoking, sleep, and so on. Um, and there are many gaps, however. And again, it's possible to construe that the healthy and ready to learn concepts emerging from the National Survey of Children's Health um, school engagement, and also positive parenting practices related to child and family um, connection and routines and habits could be considered here. And finally, are social determinants of health. And this is really getting a little higher upstream um, to say that if we're engaging families and meeting their needs and defining engagement as meeting families' needs, we would probably see improvements in social determinants of health, like having adult connections and uh, families, children have, and adolescents having family peer and other adult connections, um, even early language and literacy activities and sexual health discussions with parents. These are measures that are actually in um, the MCH MRN compendium that cut across those 11 already existing programs. The list I have here for potential gaps is long, so I won't read it, but I think we have a lot of existing data in our national and state data sets to consider, as well as many that are um, already existing in the field and in the literature. So ultimately, we have conceptual gaps for family engagement. We have, meaning there are no measures at all in important conceptual areas. We have population-based gaps, meaning we have measures, but they're not measured across all of the population groups for which we care about measuring them. We have use gaps, where the measures are there, many that I've discussed, but are not used effectively to inform policy and practice and improvement, or even in research. We have alignment issues where measures are similar, but they're not uh, conceptually, but they're not measured the same way across programs that we know need to collaborate and work together in order to improve overall systems of care for children. Measures are um, not applied for action. So there are uh, a lot of work to assess and even use the measures, but they don't reach it all the way up to decision making. And I think that's some of what the FESAT that Clarissa Hoover is going to be talking about can help make happen. Uh, measures are not collected with the demographic data and other um, topics that we need to really continue to assess the great amount of equity issues that we have in this country, and that many of those with um, inequitable health care are predom more predominant users of our health system. So when we look at wanting to improve health systems, we have to look at equity, but often the data we need to do so are not available, or the ways that we report data are not effective to informing that. And then there's the all-important issue of translation, and not assuming because data is there, it's used, 
um, has to be communicated effectively through stories and in an applied way. And finally, is specification and validity. We're often going quick, and funding can be very low compared to other sectors or family, adult health care to really validate and publish on measures. And the lack of the specification and validity harms the use of the measures that we do have when they start to be considered, such as um, is happening today. Even CMS is starting to look at measures of family belonging, and engagement is a for them, as well as, of course, for HRSA, MCHB, and Title V, yet we are behind on documenting our measures in the literature, as well as even in the reports about um, the availability of these measures. So um, to close, I wanted to summarize some of what came through for our Family Engagement Technical Working Group, which is a technical working group that's a part of the Maternal and Child Health Measurement Research Network, and we've had our annual meeting this last year. And the short-term priority actions and opportunities that were identified include clarifying definitions about what we mean by family engagement and family-centered care and across different systems and contexts and what's most important to measure now. To develop and model effective use of existing measures and measurement tools and the information collected Again, to use available data well, a um, lot of data in the National Survey of Children's Health, also some data in EHR and EMR that can be used and other sources. To go ahead and proceed with enhancing measurement of family health and family engagement in existing data collection platforms, but to do so with a lot of discernment. This can certainly um, result in recommendations to HRSA and MCHB about what they may want to consider for future versions of the NSCH or for uh, future Title V national outcome or performance measures. And my hunch is that um, HRSA and MCHB is, is, is already looking at that. Um, to synthesize existing knowledge, um, which has to continuously be done and separately often for each application, and to certainly create what we call launch and learn evaluation platforms that allow us to begin to use the best available measures, but in a way where we're bordering it with an evaluation framework to find out what's really working for whom, and to consider what I call what is called what I call citizen science models, and not just the collaborative innovation networks, which we're more used to. And the citizen science models, this would engage families directly in giving feedback about how what was assessed or measured actually helped them or did not help them as we go forward in measuring and engaging families. And then again, of course, to ensure family leadership in all the measurement development activities at all levels. Another um, list of, whoops, I think I, oh, thank you, you forwarded it for me. Um, the last set of recommendations for potential next steps, which are even broader versus the short term, um, is to really take advantage of this cross-sector commitment to family engagement that we do see in healthcare, in public health, and in child welfare, and especially in the engagement education sector, which has really been a leader in looking at measuring family engagement. To strategically review and anal analyze um, and make actionable existing data in very concrete ways. And then, of course, to advance the great work that Family Voices is doing with many others and with uh, funding from the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health on the FESAT tool. So, and publish papers on the measures that we do have so we can start documenting their validity or lack of validity and improve the measures over time. So now is the time, and I turn it over to Clarissa, who will um, go over the exciting work that she and her team is doing on family engagement measurement. Thank you very much, Christy, and thank you, Debbie, for um, the chance to share what we are working on. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Um, I wanted to start out by just reviewing quickly a little bit of what Christy was saying about the history of family engagement. Um, to the Institute of Medicine in 1999 published To Err is Human, in which healthcare quality um, consisted basically entirely of reducing medical error. 
Um, and then two late years later, followed up with Crossing the Quality Chasm, in which um, they recognized medical error of one of, as one of six elements of quality health care. Patient-centered was also one of those elements of quality health care. So um, kind of a cognitive shift, a paradigm shift already starting there um, about 20 years ago. Um, the Affordable Care Act in 2010 uses the phrase patient-centered medical home again and again and again. And so um, we see again another shift here where patient-centered isn't one component of quality health care. It is quality health care. Um, as a family leader, at this point I was a little bit concerned that in the rapid rollout of family engagement we would see a loss of all of the hard work that people had done to try and make it a really meaningful activity. Um, I have to say that that isn't how it's happened. It's been quite the opposite. Um, the patient-centered medical home implementation in 2011 and since then um, has really realized this idea that patient-centered means patient-engaged. Um, Joe Selvio, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, was the first person who I used that phrase. Uh, who I heard use that phrase, and I've seen it um, just showing up in all of these different places. So um, I have to give credit to all of the professionals who have taken the opportunity to really jump on this and make patient-centered and patient-engaged a meaningful thing that gives us the opportunity to transform our health care. Um, Maternal Child Health Bureau began promoting family partnerships in the 1980s, mainstream and monitoring them in the 1990s. Um, I wanted to mention that again because there's this context behind everything that we do that on the one hand, the Maternal and Child Health Bureau has been doing a lot of work for a very long time to build the foundations for this. On the other hand, things are changing so quickly um, that we don't necessarily have the resources or the expertise to do everything that we want to do. Um, I just tell families, you know, be patient, we're all learning. Um, I also tell them, you know, don't, don't be afraid of researchers. They're more afraid of you than you are of them. <laughs> um, you know, it's just kind of a, a, a challenging transition right now, but it's so full of opportunity. And so to bring that full circle, I want to repeat again what I think that, you know, if you're here, you understand this. To have family-centered services, we must have family-engaged research. Um, the, the research needs to meet the needs of families in order to lay the foundation for services that meet our needs. So um, Christy mentioned several times the FESAT, um, the, which is the Family Engagement and Systems Assessment Tool. Um, that is currently in development with funding from the Lucille Packard Foundation for Children's Health. Um, we're working with Christy on that and with a great team, um, a great expert work group um, is supporting that work as well. Um, that is expected to be released later this year. Um, today I'm going to focus on the framework that provides the structure for that tool. Um, it is at this level more of a strategic framework in that it makes the connection between the actions that we get, the family engagement that we do, um, and the results that we want. Um, it was developed by experienced family partners through a structured and stakeholder engaged process. Um, and it consists of four domains. It's important to address each of the four domains for meaningful and sustainable family engagement. Um, meaningful and sustainable is another of those ineffable concepts that Christy was referring to. Um, it's a phrase that occurred again and again when we completed a literature review of family engagement. And it's kind of our um, guidepost in terms of what we want family engagement to be. Um, the Family Engagement and Systems Framework consists of four domains, which are commitment, transparency, representation, and impact. I'm going to go into each of these in a little more detail now. Um, so in the commitment domain, um, an overview of what that means is family engagement is a core value. All partners make themselves available to work together in good faith. Families are engaged at all stages of research. And family leaders are connected with ongoing opportunities to partner if they wish, um, which is an idea that may be a little bit um, 
unfamiliar, but the idea is that we think of this as a capacity building opportunity for families, and we think about where they want to be, um, how they want participation, partner partnering in research to help them build both as individuals and within their communities. Um, why commitment matters. Um, it allows engagement to be iterative and cumulative. So instead of building it up, um, I think a lot of people with past experience with family engagement have seen this. You build it up, it disappears, everything goes away, you start over from scratch. Instead of doing that again and again and again, um, we sustain it and we have the chance to build on what we've accomplished rather than starting over. Um, very much related to this idea of iterative and cumulative is building trust with the community, building a reputation for follow through. Um, people don't come in from the community and say things to a researcher and then it just kind of goes nowhere as far as they're concerned um, because they don't see it landing in journal articles or whatever and it never comes back to their own community. Um, so you have to follow through on what you've told them you're trying to do in a way that they can understand and see. Um, developing a cadre of skilled family leaders. Um, when, when people are in, involved in an ongoing way, they have a chance to um, develop their skills. You know, people develop individually in different directions, but it all enriches the process and enriches the conversation into something that's more and more constructive and informed. Um, relationships support recruitment of new family leaders and fresh perspectives. Um, and the relationships that the researcher has with the community um, support them forming connect, connection, more and more connections and connections with multiple family leaders rather than um, just going back to the same people again and again. And avoiding helicopter science, which is a phrase that's familiar here in New Mexico. Um, it started with the idea of reservations that researchers would come in on a helicopter for a weekend or a month and then leave again. And you know, once again, the community would never see the impact um, of what they were told was going to happen. So some activities that contribute to commitment that um, lead to commitment or realize the possibilities of commitment are interweaving different engagement activities to suit different purposes. So um, instead of talking about what's not possible, you know, we can't do an advisory council in this setting, so we're not going to do family engagement. We start focusing on how. Um, what is the, there's a lot of different ways to engage. What is the strategy that works best for what we're currently doing? And how can we get multiple strategies going in the same project so that they feed each other and build a community of uh, family leaders around our project and um, become more robust and engage in dialogue with each other, um, things really start to take off um, when you're talking about different engagement activities to suit different purposes. Um, partner with families in choosing goals. Um, this is goals at this point, not necessarily measurable goals or measurable outcomes, but more of overarching guideposts. Um, that help us keep on track and know when what we're doing is accomplishing what families need us to accomplish. Working with family-led and community-based organizations, and this is to provide support to family leaders in the project. Um, family-led and community-based organizations, these are terms that have a very specific meaning. They're referring to organizations that are staffed out of the community that they're working with and are rooted in the communities that they're working with and have relationships there that they can use to help your project and help your family leaders in your project. Um, hiring family leaders as staff, um, either, for example, as interviewers or uh, as um, recruiters, um, often working in a community role, working in community relationships, although not always. Um, we want to be very clear that this is facilitating your relationships with the community not replacing them. You still need um, people from the community who are not embedded in your project who are helping to partner in your project and help you with major decisions. Um, and then last, but as everybody probably knows, not at all least, um, pay family leaders for their work um, as you would pay any employee or anybody who was consulting on your project, um, and budget for engagement costs including costs that aren't necessarily staff time, such as travel to co-present at conferences 
or um, travel funds for families who are driving long distances to get to you. Um, moving on to the next domain, which is transparency. Um, the overview is that transparency, um, sorry, this language is sort of the general language. I didn't correct this for to be research specific. But the organization clearly documents and communicates about how it identifies issues faced by the children and families they serve and supports and engages family leaders in the organization's policy program, service, or practice initiatives. Um, so of course, in the research context, we're talking about um, things like writing proposals and um, making decisions every step along the way. Um, sorry, clicking in the wrong spot. Um, why transparency matters. Um, this is kind of an interesting domain, because when we talk about the list of activities next, it's got one of the longest lists of activities. But in terms of why it's important, it really just comes down to the central idea of balancing power, um, sharing power, that if families are marginalized within the process, they aren't going to be able to help change direction of the research, and it's just not going to meet that criteria for being meaningful. And so we think about balancing power in terms of um, access to um, opportunities. For example, the chance to come to the right meetings where really important decisions are made. Um, knowledge, do families have the background knowledge that they need in order to understand conversations that are happening around them so that they can participate in meaningful ways skills, including advocacy skills, or um, you know, sometimes that can be a matter of um, riding the bus or joining a conference call. Families don't necessarily come in with all of the skills that they need in order to participate and partner in meaningful ways. Um, access to confidence, so the setting is supportive and friendly and um, really emphasizes that family leaders have something to offer and that what they have to offer is appreciated. And position, um, again, is partly a matter of being in the right place at the right time. So some transparency activities include understanding the issues faced by the community, um, including things that aren't necessarily um, what you would think of immediately. Um, for example, a person with disabilities in a wheelchair might feel uncomfortable sitting at your conference table because of the way it's shaped or because of the height. Like It just doesn't work for how they are seated. Um, you have to talk to them to learn about things like that. You, you're not going to know right away because their life experience is so different from yours. Um, scheduling, communication, and follow-up for meetings are all available to people in languages they understand, in formats they understand. Um, communication is through text if people want text, through emails if they want emails, through phone calls if they want phone calls. That's partly going to be shaped by the age of your participants or things like that. Um, plain language and person-first language. Avoid or explain jargon and acronyms. Um, a lot of jargon that professionals use, they don't even necessarily recognize as jargon. Uh, you have to take the little hints when family leaders start asking you what something means, that that's a term that isn't clear. Um, person first language means um, keeping a person distinct from their health condition or their disability. Um, my daughter was in the hospital last week, and one of the nurses called her a CFer. Um, you know, don't call my daughter a cf -er. Her cystic fibrosis is a very different issue from who she is, which is a really amazing person. Um, so she's, she's a person with CF. She's a beautiful young lady who has cystic fibrosis. Um, support special needs. Um, the conference table example is one example. Language access. Um, once again, there's so many different special needs that people can have. You aren't going to know what they are unless you're talking to people about what they are. And this can include issues that people are embarrassed to mention. So the warm, supportive environment is um, very helpful there in getting people to come forward and mention some issue that just happens to affect them. Um, you know, a person with autism might be distracted by a buzzing in the room or that sort of thing. 
um, partner with family-led and uh, community-based organizations for support. Um, I had actually mentioned that before under the previous domain. Um, that is something that helps across all different kinds of areas. In this case, it's that um, members of the community can help you produce materials that are more accessible to members of their own community. They can tell you about these special needs that you may not know about because they already have those relationships, because they're already trusted within the community. They have this background knowledge that can be difficult to access when you're starting a new project with new partners. And I mentioned that this was the longest list of activities. Um, comfortable modes of communication. Um, I had used those examples before of texting for um, people who are more comfortable with texting, phones for people who are more comfortable with phones. Um, and then skills building, including cultural competency and avoiding personal biases. Um, for family leaders, focus on their family expertise, not trying to give them professional expertise. I know it's often tempting to say, oh, this person needs to understand Healthy People 2020, or um, you know, this person needs to understand why it's so important to research this particular area from a research perspective. Um, they're bringing in their own expertise as families. And the skills that they need are really about how they can maximize their expertise, how they can communicate things that are difficult to communicate. Um, how they can speak up in, in situations that may be uncomfortable for them. Um, it's really a very particular skill set that we're talking about when we talk about that. Um, and then for professionals, recognize family engagement as a distinct area of professional expertise. When we were doing key important informant interviews as part of developing this framework, um, we found that this was one of the areas that um, you know, people recognize it when you ask them about it, but it, they didn't necessarily come in thinking about that there are specific skills that are required for professionals to do these engagement tasks. Um, you know, to some extent, it depends on what field you're in, um, what matters to your community that you're working with, and what skills you already bring to the table. Um, but there are definitely distinct skills that are important for working with families in ways that families experience as constructive. So on to the next domain, which is representation. Um, representation occurs when family leaders reflect the diversity of the community served. Um, in the Family Engagement and Systems Assessment Tool, we call out race, ethnicity, culture, language, disability, age, gender, geographic area. Um, and by geographic area, we're talking about specific urban areas, specific rural areas, um, and any other factors that are going on in the region you're working in that you need to consider in terms of diversity. Um, there may also be localized divides within your specific community, such as labor and management. Um, People will tell you if there are issues like this. Sometimes it just comes up the one time, and you have to catch it that one time, or you miss it. Um, another really good place to look in terms of thinking about who you need to represent in your family engagement is who have you called out in your justifications and proposals, in abstracts for articles, you know, in introductions. Um, this is an implied promise that can only be kept by connecting with these communities. So for example, if you're researching preterm birth and you say African American women have particularly high rates of preterm birth, and then you proceed with a project that doesn't talk to African American women, um, our experience with that has been that sort of a mainstream project doesn't help address disparities like that. You have to work with that specific community in order to have a meaningful impact and in order to improve outcomes in that community. And so this is where representation becomes incredibly important. So why it matters. Um, nothing about us without us. You know, that again has to do that with that. If you mention somebody in your justification, you should be talking to them. Um, you know, otherwise, you're kind of using their situation to justify what you're doing, but not looping them in um, to make sure that it's meaningful for them. Um, representation reduces disparities and increases generalizability. Um, it also offers strength through diversity. Um, you know, this isn't an idle phrase. This is a documentable fact. Um, I'm suggesting that you Google 
monocropping, if you want to hear about what the opposite of strength through diversity is, you know, Google groupthink. That's the opposite of strength through diversity. When we mix up a lot of different ideas, whether it's from different cultural contexts or different educational contexts, different professional contexts, um, it just enriches our conversations and brings in all of these new ideas that can then become innovations within our work. Um, avoid embarrassing mistakes um, by, you know, like don't have photos that certain elements of your communi community look at your photo and think, oh my gosh, what are you thinking, you know. Um, don't have language you're using that um, means something different in certain branches of your community that isn't what you intended to make. Um, so, you know, sometimes there's very simple stuff that can be caught up front if you're engaging with a diverse group of people. Um, it also offers the chance for dynamic learning from other family leaders. Um, so I mentioned several times how family leaders are building their own capacity, um, you know, maybe continuing with this work as um, family leaders, digging deeper and deeper into it, maybe moving into more of a professional role that blends with their family role, um, or maybe they're going to take this work into some other entirely different area of their life, but it's still going to change them and they're still going to grow for it. Um, when they have the chance to learn from other family leaders who have very different experiences from themselves, you know, whatever direction they're going to go with this in the future, it expands their knowledge, it builds their capacity, and um, it just helps them to grow, to have a broader, more systems-oriented perspective rather than one that's really tied in with their own personal experiences. So um, representation activities include representing race, ethnicity, culture, language, disability, age, gender, and geographic area. Um, we know that that, is, that that doesn't always work out the way that it sounds like it does when we just say, hey, represent everybody. It'll be great. Um, you know, sometimes there are conflicts that emerge if you put two different groups in a room together. Um, sometimes there are people who just feel incredibly uncomfortable with the entire research con concept. And you have to bridge that divide before you can really have constructive conversations. Um, so to drill a little deeper into what that means, um, going where people are, um, in this case I mean physically, although that can also mean, um, I don't know, more cognitively or intellectually. Um, you know, go to church if they are at a certain church. Go to a community-based organization if they're at a particular community-based organization. Um, don't make them deal with university parking if that's a huge barrier, which um, it often is. Um, you know, you do the, you go the more than halfway so that it's easier for them to meet you in that place. Um, partner with family-led and community-based community organizations for recruitment. Um, they will often have a familiarity in the community or have um, relationships in the community that will allow them to identify people who are a good fit for your project, who are interested in your project. and. Um, you know, help you form connections um, without having to um, start, start from nothing, <laughs> um, if that's where you are in your project. Um, and then identify issues in other domains that are particularly important for diverse communities that you're working with. Um, for example, in the transparency domain, I talked about um, accessible communication. And there's obviously going to be a lot of different issues depending on what community you're working with in terms of communication. And so although that appears in the transparency domain, it is also very important to representation. So an overview of impact. Um, engaging with families changed what you did and how you did it. Planning, execution, and dissemination and impact of families is recognized and acknowledged. Um, I am noticing that I am not doing all that great for time here. And I know we've got lots of great questions coming in. So I'm going to hop through this as quick as I can. And we'll move on to what all of you are um, talking about. Um, so impact is about learning from experience, um, visualizing success. And this gets a little interesting when I talk about a measurement tool that has impact as a measurement domain. We aren't necessarily talking about measuring outcomes or measuring the endpoint. We're talking about impact as it's felt throughout the process. 
and how like if impact falls flat in the opening stages of your process, you're never going to reach those outcomes. Um, so I'll skip over that quickly. Um, impact activities, sit with it before reacting. I think it's so important if a family leader says something that you're not comfortable with, instead of just jumping on it, take a moment to really understand and um, kind of get past that first defensive reaction and take it in. Um, family leaders are engaged qualitatively. Um, Co-production, which refers to the work, not just the credit for the work. That means that you don't just say somebody authored a paper. They actually helped write the paper. Um, and then the family leaders are engaged in selecting the outcomes that you're focusing on. So once again, those domains are commitment, transparency, representation, and impact. And um, thank you all for joining us today. And thank you for all of your questions, which we are now ready to move on to. Thank you so much, Dr. Bethel and Ms. Hoover. What an informative and interesting presentation. We really appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise with the MCH community. We are now ready for the question and answer period. Jim, could you please remind the audience how they can submit questions? Yeah, to ask a question on the web, please enter your question in the field at the bottom of the Q&A pod in the bottom left corner of your screen. Uh, enter your question, press the enter key. Your question will be sent directly to the moderator. It will only be seen by the moderator. Back to you, Deborah. Great. Thank you. I think we have our first question. Our first question is for Dr. Bethel. Um, this question is about whether um, this is a chicken versus egg scenario. Um, how do we know that families are more resilient because they are engaged, or if they are more engaged because of increased resilience? Great question. Actually, the other day, I was thinking we should write a paper on how it's the wrong question. It's the chicken and the egg, <laughs> you know? And so chicken and egg issues are important in certain contexts, but I'm not sure they're that important here. If families are engaged because they're resilient, they still need to be engaged. If families aren't engaged because they aren't resilient, then building resilience is the activity that we need to do, not only to engage them, but because it's critical to the health of their children and their own well-being. So um, I suspect and actually have some evidence that family resilience is higher when the experience they have with their providers is positive in terms of communication and listening and other variables that indicate engagement, much higher. At the same time, you can't really tie the, tease that apart. Ha however, it is likely that families who are already more resilient and innately engaged will be more likely to lean in to, t to become, to make sure that engagement happens. And so we have to be very attuned to the individual differences of families and meet them where they are, and regardless of where they are, to work toward engagement um, because it's a critical, it's obviously critical. So I think it's chicken and egg, and I'm, I think it's very important to discern when it's, when it's important to, to separate those things, and that's probably most likely in a research context. And in a research context, we're going to see probably well, we have to use simultaneous equation modeling, if you will, because the outcome of engagement is predicted by resilience, and yet the resilience is predicted by engagement. And that's true for a lot of the things that we're seeking to address in healthcare and in systems. Great. Thank you. We had another question for Ms. Hoover. Um, what might be some first steps you recommend to researchers who are new to engaging families in their work? Um, I recommend to start with what seems most accessible to you. Um, this, this is a little bit lightweight, but it can even just be like talking with a friend who you happen to have who has a diagnosis. Um, related to the work that you're doing, or um, yeah, I mean, it's just having like real conversations with real people and giving them a chance to um, tell you how your research looks to them. Um, often, 
the language that you're using is kind of the first barrier. Like you may be interested in the same things as families, but you're talking about it in terms that they don't understand. And so you need to kind of get warmed up to where you can um, give, you know, we always call that the elevator speech, like the speech you would give to somebody in an elevator if you're explaining what you're doing. Um, can you explain it to your mother? Um, can you explain it to your children? And then as you get more comfortable with talking about your research in those very accessible terms, um, conversations around it will get easier. Um, another step is to contact a community-based organization and see if they have um, people from the community who they recommend who you can make contact with. Um, you can browse the internet. There's some very interesting conversations going out there on um, like patient communities, um, very frank conversations. Um, you know that that it very often like sort of the hardest things are the things that are fairly easy to address with these fairly lightweight thing ideas. And then once you start to make the shift to how this perspective looks when you're looking at things from a patient perspective, then um, it sort of starts to build on itself and you start to get more of a feel for who you need to be talking to and about what. Great, thank you. So we had a request for the one of the links that Clarissa was talking about earlier that was a framework. So we're going to show that link um, up here. And we also had a request for getting more information on data from the NCH measurement research network. So um, those links are posted on the screen um, and feel free to visit them. And um, we are almost out of time today, so I wanted to thank you all so much for a great presentation and for sharing your expertise. If you did not get a chance to ask your question for the speaker, please feel, feel free to submit your question through the Q&A field and we'll try to respond to your questions after the webinar. We are now almost at the end of our program, and after this webinar, you will receive a request to complete an evaluation. We hope that you will fill this out and provide the MCH Division of Research feedback on today's event. Your response will help us plan future webinars in the Enrich series. Thank you all for your attendance and participation. I also want to thank Jen Rogers and Jim Weatherill at Altrum for helping to organize this event. An archive of today's webinar will be available on the Division of Research website in several weeks. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone.